start now. <clears throat> this is a public hearing of the Committee of the Whole regarding bills number 180, 162, 180, 163, 180, 164, and resolution number 180, 185. Mr. McDermott, please read the title of the bills and resolution. Bill number 180-162, an ordinance to adopt the capital program for the six fiscal years 2019-2024 inclusive. Bill number 180-163, an ordinance to adopt a fiscal 2019 capital budget. Bill number 180-164, an ordinance adopting the operating budget for fiscal year 2019. And resolution number 180-185, Resolution providing for the approval by the Council of the City of Philadelphia of a revised five-year financial plan for the City of Philadelphia covering fiscal years 2019 through 2023 and incorporating proposed changes with respect to fiscal year 2018, which is to be submitted to the Mayor, uh, to the Pennsylvania Intergovernmental Cooperation Authority, pursuant to the Intergovernmental Cooperation Agreement authorized by an ordinance of this Council approved by the Mayor on January 3rd, 1992, by and between the City and the Authority. Thank you, Mr. McDermott. Today we continue the public hearing of the committee to hold to consider the bills read by the clerk that constitute proposed operating and capital spending measures for fiscal year 2019, a capital program, and a forward-looking capital plan for fiscal 2019 through fiscal 2024. Today we will hear testimony from the following city departments, planning and development, license inspection, and the Office of Tech Information and Technology. Mr. McDermott, the first person to testify from the administration is... Ann Fadulin, Planning and Development. Thank you very much. Please come forward. Good morning, morning. Council President Clark. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Ann Fadulin, Director of Planning and Development. Um, good morning, Council President Clark and members of City Council. Uh, Ann Fadulin, Director of Planning and Development, and joining me today are Kathy Califano, First Deputy for Planning and Development, who's behind me, Eleanor Sharp, Deputy Director for Planning and Zoning, Paul Cesario, who's also uh, behind me, Deputy Director for Finance, Melissa Long, um, Director for Housing Community Development Programs, and uh, John Monlock is also with us, Deputy Director for Development Services, and I think we also have some other members of the planning and development agencies. I'm pleased to provide testimony on planning development fiscal year 2019 operating budget. Um, I've submitted more thorough written testimony and so I'm just gonna summarize some key points in my verbal testimony. The Department of Planning and Development coordinates the city's planning, zoning, preservation, and housing functions. Our goal is to promote the social and economic well-being of the city and all its neighborhoods. As we pursue these strategies, we do so with the goal of engaging residents, the development community, and other stakeholders. Planning and development is approaching the end of its first year as an official department, and we are continuing to build a collaborative and effective agency. I'd like to highlight some of the strategies that will be supported by modest increases in our fiscal year 19 budget. We will expand our housing, counseling, and foreclosure prevention support to better serve households at risk of tax foreclosure. Since the program's inception in 2008, we have saved more than 11,000 homes from foreclosure, and we look forward to helping more Philadelphians remain in their homes. Often, the most affordable home is the one you are already in. So with the increased funding for counseling in fiscal year 19, we are hopeful we can keep more homeowners in their current homes. We will expand our development services team to assist more key development projects um, and create more construction and permanent jobs. In our new structure, development services has supported affordable housing and community projects in addition to for-profit development. And expanded staff will help us move more projects forward. We will continue to ramp up the acquisitions and dispositions of property by the land bank following the land bank strategic plan and its policies that council approved last fall. Since Angel Rodriguez became the Land Bank's first permanent executive director, we have made significant strides towards meeting our acquisition and disposition goals for this fiscal year, um, and we continue to work diligently to get the Land Bank up and fully operational. We have also allocated funding as part of a long-term strategy to increase the diversity of the planning and development workforce. Diversity in our workforce is important to Mayor Kenny, and it is important to our department. Our goal is to have a workforce that reflects the diversity of the residents we serve. 
A challenge we face, however, is that some of the fields from which we recruit staff do not have a diverse pool of potential employees. Um, for example, over 90% of the membership in the American Planning Association is white. Um, to counter the problem, we're working to expose more young Philadelphians and especially young people of color to our work. We've partnered with the West Philadelphia, High, West Philadelphia High School to engage students at the City Planning Commission developed its West Dist as the City Planning Commission developed its West District Plan. We have made presentations to high school and middle school students, and we will reach out to schedule more. So to date, we have um, had either sessions where we've gone out to high schools and middle schools or had them come in to tour and meet our staff at the Planning Commission with over 25 educational institutions. For our internship programs, we've expanded our recruitment to include more historically black colleges and universities, and we have added non-planning majors to the study areas from which we recruit. We have also identified funds in our budget to support college students who do not have the financial capacity to accept an internship only for experience or college credit. Through these funds, we hope to increase the ethnic and economic diversity of our interns. We recognize that these strategies will not result in changes in our workforce in the short term. That is why our recruitment for permanent positions seeks as diverse a candidate pool as possible and why we have established a diversity and inclusion committee within our department. This committee is used to brainstorm um, ideas on how to increase our candidate pool and make all our employees feel welcome. However, it is our hope that by exposing young Philadelphians to our work today, we are developing the workforce, diverse workforce of tomorrow. The City Planning Commission's de uh, development of district plans will conclude in the first half of fiscal year 19. The Commission, along with the Citizens Planning Institute, continues to engage residents to plan for the future of their neighborhoods. As its permit review responsibilities grew, the Historical Commission had less time to devote to historic designations. With additional funding, Council and the Mayor provided this fiscal year, the Historic Commission is now developing more time to reviewing historic resources. Um, examples of these are there's a uh, district on West, the 1400 block of West Girard Avenue that will be going to the May Historic Commission meeting. Um, the review of the Overbrook Farms uh, district is now underway and the Satterley Heights and Lutheran Seminary districts um, are going to be considered by the commission this summer. I believe that our department has taken significant strides since we officially formed last summer. I am confident in our ability to move forward and I'm excited about our next steps. Uh, we would be happy to answer any questions council members may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Vidulin. Uh, just have a couple of quick ones to start. Um, <clears throat> Under the uh, reorg uh, charter change legislation, uh, part of that call for the creation of the Housing Advisory Board. Um, can you tell me what the status of and who the members are and whether or not they have been meeting on a consistent basis? And, right. So, and it's a two-part question. I might yep. as well get the second. And, okay. and at the end of the day, for those that don't know, um, should be responsible for regular development of a multi-year strategic housing plan for the city. That includes recommendations for maintaining and increasing affordable housing, workforce housing, market rate housing, and the division shall consult with and seek advice from the Housing Advisory Board in its preparation of such plans. So you can just kind of tell me where you are with that. So the Housing Advisory Board has been seated. Um, I believe they've, I, I can't tell you exactly how many meetings they've had, but they have been meeting, I believe, on pretty much a quarterly basis. Um, in addition, there was an initial subcommittee formed that looked at preservation for uh, subsidized affordable rental that's coming out of, aging out of its compliance period and that could be at risk um, because we don't have as many dollars as we used to have to subsidize rental housing. So they were looking at that. Um, however, now we, uh, when do we put out the RFP? We put it out in January. So we put out an RFP in January for the Housing Action Plan, which is the plan that you described that's in the charter change, looking at the housing market from everything from homeless all the way up to the luxury market. Um, we have preliminarily selected a consultant. We're actually meeting with them <laughs> this yep. afternoon to finalize scope and budget. And the time frame is to have that plan in place by this fall. Um, and that will set out it will be pretty prescriptive. We're looking at this to really be an action plan, not another, for example, 800-page um, assessment of fair housing. 
And this will be a very um, small, short document, but easily understandable. It will lay out specific goals that we want to achieve over the next 10 years, mm -hmm. um, specifically in the areas of homeless housing, um, preservation of affordable rental, and creation of affordable rental, preservation of affordable home ownership, creation of home ownership, um, and, all, and it also include the um, market rate home ownership as well. So we anticipate getting this underway, I would say in the next couple weeks, yes. and working very diligently um, to get this done by fall. We're gonna use some existing task force groups, so we have a already um, a eviction preservation task force, historic preservation task force, some of these other things. So we're gonna feed into that work, but then we also have stakeholder groups that we've set up around things like um, cost of construction and the technology of construction. Are there ways we can achieve cost savings there? Um, resources and financing, are there more creative ways we could be using our dollars? Um, things, we talked about the affordable preservation of rental housing, whether it's naturally occurring or subsidized. There's a subcommittee around that, home ownership. So we're in the process of getting that plan underway. Okay, so thank you. Who, who's in charge of the uh, board? Who's the chair? I think I am. You are. <laughs> All right, so it's you, hard for me to keep track sometimes, to be correct. honest with you, but yes. Right. So when you stated earlier, you weren't sure as to how many meetings? I believe we've so, met three or four times. I mean, we have regularly three, quarter, three. I think we have quarterly meetings on the schedule. I'll be frank, we had a meeting scheduled for, I want to say this week. Um, but we felt that we weren't ready because it's about, it was about rolling out our goals and discussing that through our housing advisory plan. Uh, our housing action plan, so we've rescheduled that one for June. Um, but there have been subcommittee meetings of that board meeting. Okay. Are there minutes or any summaries of? Do we have any we, minutes? I mean, if, just yes. summaries of yes, we what, do. where you are we do. so we can kind of review. Yeah, we have those. We can provide them to yeah, your that office. Would be helpful. helpful. Yep. Sure. Um, reorg. We reorganization. Oh, yeah, reorg. I'm yeah. sorry. I know, I, you know you don't want to really want to talk about that. But um, where, where are we at with the reorg? And I know that a significant aspect of that is our ability to deal with the quote-unquote union issue. Yes. Can you tell me, are we anywhere close so to resolving we are, that issue? So we are in discussions. Um, I think that we have, there has been, um, I'm not sure how much of that I can talk about because we are in the process of negotiating, yeah. um, but we have broached that topic. There seems to be some willingness to move on that, uh, but we're in the process of trying to move that forward. Yeah. Um, and we are actually, at the management level, engaging in, um, sh should we be successful and be able to do that, what that would look like, how we would, how we would do that. Yeah. Okay, um, one, one question. Anybody here representing the Art Commission? No, we didn't bring him. We didn't bring Bill Burke. We didn't bring him? <laughs> We can God. see if we can it's get them. Just an oversight. Yeah, yeah, no. You know, you know what I want to ask about. You know, advertising revenue. Uh, since the art commission is under right, your yes. jurisdiction, right? Yes. All right. If they happen to be close by, it would be helpful if they can just okay. kind of come over and I want to we'll see what see their answer is this year. We will see if we can get them over why here. we won't, um, you know, get money outside of sticking our hands in taxpayers' pockets, particularly given the assessments that just came out. Right. Um, a lot of people got sticker shock, and if there's any way that we can raise revenue for schools outside of taxes, I think that at some point people need to understand understand certain traditional values that people have, but we have to start figuring out some non-traditional strategies. So if they can get here before you're done, it will be helpful. Okay. And if not, we're going to get them on call back. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Chair recognized Councilman Greenlee. Thank you, Mr. President. I would have bet you were going to ask about the Art Commission. So, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, couple. Of, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, the um, on the issue, uh, basic system repair. Yes. Uh, where are we on that? As far as waiting lists, are people being accepted for that now? All right. Or? Give How me a minute, because I have or, the actual data, so just let me get yeah. there. Maybe on those other programs, too, just quickly, you know, so, weatherization, emergency heater repair. Right. Just kind of where are we? Okay. Um, so overall, for um, basic system repair and weatherization, or 
hold on, here we go, bond activity. Okay, so basic system repair, we've made um, just over 1,650 repairs. Um, about nine, uh, 925 of those are completed, so case stays open until we can do the final work. Right. Um, we've had some issues getting plumbers, so there's some plumbing work that is preventing us. But Why would that be? I mean, there's a lot of plumbers out there. <laughs> well, they're also very busy. Okay. That's been our biggest issue, honestly, okay. is, right. you know, are you going to do a, I don't know, $5 million plumbing job or are you going to do a $1,000 plumbing yeah. job? Okay. Right. So we're, we're, but we're working to address that. Um, we're, we've got a, about uh, 1,900 cases that are in the process of getting assigned to a contractor, and we spent about $9 million of um, the initial bond money for basic system repair. Um, for the adaptive modification program, we've made a repairs to 350 plus houses. Um, we have about 100 in the queue waiting to get assigned to a contractor, and we've spent about $950,000. Are those programs? No. Oh, those programs still open where people can apply? Or, or um, so remember the bond activity was about clearing up backlog. Okay, right. Um, then, so then our non-bond activity, which is more of our current cases, um, we've made about 900, a little over 900 repairs for the basic system repair program. Um, we've got about a little over three, almost 340 cases that are in the process of getting assigned to contractors, and we've spent $3.36 million. Mm -hmm. Um, for LIHEAP, which is our weatherization piece, mm -hmm. um, we've made just shy of 390 repairs, um, and we've spent just over $850,000. Um, so uh, we are well on our way, we believe, with our bond program. Um, we've started in you know fall of last year, so we're six, seven months in, and we've we've thought we'd spend 20 million. We're at 9 million, so we are well on track to to achieve that goal. Mm -hmm. um, just as an aside, but also I think really important, um, as far as where that total of so we've got almost just shy of 17 million dollars in awarded contracts. Uh, thir over 30 percent of those have gone to certified MBE mm -hmm. contractors. Another 12.5% have gone to non-certified MBE contractors, so that total comes to almost 43%. Um, WBE certified has gone to almost 9%, and uncertified another 2.3%, um, so there we're about 12%. Uh, so overall, we're at about we're at 55%. Uh, okay. Those figures, particularly the ones you, you first mentioned about the, the repairs and all, could that be sent to the council president? Sure. If, I don't know if we have that. Yeah, we can provide you okay. reports on where we are with that. Okay, I appreciate that. One other thing, and I feel I have to say this since uh, uh, periodically we get on Mr. Grigorski when he comes to the Rules Committee about this, and he does a great job, by the way. Uh, but um, I know lots of times, I think at least three, four times, I've gotten, uh, and I've, we've put in the bills to uh, make changes in the, in the uh, zoning code. And really the argument that usually is used is, you know, as time goes on, we've seen changes, adjustments we have to make, which I get. The, the problem seems to be, though, when council members put in bills to make adjustments in their districts and they go to the Rules Committee, oftentimes the Planning Commission then says, well, we should stick, we, we have a plan here we, and we should stick with it, which leads many of us to believe that the only people who think they can make changes are the planning folks. So I was wondering if there's any, you have any reaction. We just had one yesterday in Burytown where it was a relatively modest change, but it was a change to, that was uh, reacting to the changes in the neighborhood where it was getting overly congested. And I know the council president knows, but I know because I just live a little shorter there. And yet the answer, the planning commission um, report said was against it because well, we had this bill in 2014 and we should stick to it. Well, we had the zoning code a few years ago and we keep changing it. So I'm trying to see the consistency here, if I'm making sense. Eleanor Sharp, Planning Commission Executive Director also. Mm -hmm. So there are two things which I, I'll, I'll help to clarify. Mm -hmm. When it comes to zoning changes, that comes out of the work of the district plan work, which is very different from modifying our existing zoning code. So the zoning code modifications are amendments that through, um, 
a network of people, not just a planning commission, it includes a zoning technical committee that's made okay. up of law, L&I, stakeholder groups who says this part of the code is not working, it's not functional, can you please make mm -hmm. an amendment? Okay. That's bucket A. Bucket B, the planning commission staff works very closely with communities, with stakeholders, with groups to propose rezoning amendments, very different from the zoning code. Zoning amendments to say what a parcel should be in terms of what proposed land uses should be. And those, that's under the purview of the Planning Commission to say, for future development, for best uses, this is what we believe. And we are perfectly open that there are disagreements and people mm -hmm. don't agree with us. That's, that's where it comes from. So there's a distinction between the two. I see a distinction, but it's still, I still, because when, who meets with us? It's Planning Commission folks. When we they want the to council. change the zoning code. We so it, it eventually gets the same place. Though. I mean, the same world, I guess I would say. I'm not sure about that, sir. Okay. We do meet with council. We don't, we, okay. city council is part of our stakeholder group. We don't propose changes without having feedback and interaction, especially when it comes to no, I get, zoning changes. I get, I get why you do the zoning code. I guess what I'm, I'm just, I don't, and we get it a lot. I'm not saying every single bill that goes in, mm -hmm. but we, we hear, and Councilman Jones had one in his district, I think at the last, I think we've all, all the district council people have had, and it just seems that the argument is we should stick to what was there already. No, if, I don't, I don't. If, well, that's if, what it says. If I that's mean, the argument. That's what me, it says. Let me help to clarify that then. That's not the argument. Because whatever we're proposing is at the moment in time and what the commission in their professional opinion thinks mm -hmm. is what needs to happen at that point. And we're very open to that not being agreed to. One of the things that we are consistent about as a planning commission when it comes to the zoning code is introducing numerous overlays for especially project-based parcels because then that will put us in a position in five, ten years from now that we need to redo the zoning code again because there's too many overlays to reference. That is a standard, mm -hmm. that is a planning commission okay. perspective. So okay. if that's what you're hearing, that's appropriate. But whatever recommendation we have is based on a moment in time, what we believe is best for the parcel, which we're very, as I said, open to like okay. having people not agree with our right. stance. One last thing, I, you know, I don't want to get back and forth on this. When you, when there's these recommendations made, like on the bill and Bury changes, does somebody actually go out and look at the area? We look at every single parcel in the city. So you're, you're every you single. It. Okay. So you see that there has been, Correct. in this case, a lot of congestion. We don't sit in our office and just make okay. random determinations. All right. Okay. Well, other people that are out there seem to think differently, but okay. But that's okay. We'll have a difference of it opinion. It makes for democratic And usually, usually we pass the bill that the council members think is appropriate. Thank you, Mr. President. I concur, Councilman. Thank you. Um, <laughs> she recognized Councilman Jones. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Councilman Greenlee. We most recently went through that, but I think that creates a balance of us doing what we want, you think of what we should, and then we get in our, you having your say, and we get in our way anyway. So I, I think it works out pretty well. So it's working for you? That's working for you getting that's, your way? That's working balance. <laughs> it's working for me. Um, first, let me say, um, it seems like yesterday uh, when um, I asked a question of the sheriff of the city of Philadelphia, was there a crisis looming uh, back in, I think, 08 or uh, about sheriff sales. And we, he got back to me uh, a little late, but he got back to me and said, yes. He said this was the highest number of sheriff sales in the city of Philadelphia's history. This council took action, and we created the Morgan Diver Mortgage Diversion Task Force, which created the program. It brought my heart good to hear that somewhere near 11,000 homes, Mr. President, has, has been saved, and that's real public policy, working together with the administration, working with private institutions to create a product um, that people took advantage of. I turn the page quickly and talk about another initiative this council, and this council president in particular talked about, was about 3,000 properties that were identified that were imminently dangerous of some type of tax uh, takeover or being available for development in workforce housing. 
with the looming cuts at the HUD level, CDBG dollars, are we coalescing a affordable housing strategy? Uh, Sister uh, Maria here has been fighting for that uh, throughout um, this year and, and years past. How are we working with all of the stakeholders to come up with a plan? And part two of that question is, is why was the eviction task force established? And is that a high number of evictions we're seeing from the rental side, not on the home ownership side, but the rental side? And if that is so, what are we doing to stop it? Okay. Um, so I'm gonna try to cover what I, what I think were the questions in there. So, so one just take was, the thank you for the uh, foreclosure program that right, you're running. Right. And then move to the room. We'll take that, thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but I think you talked about um, kind of an overall strategy, right? So that is exactly what we hope to achieve with our housing action plan, is really setting clear-cut goals and then um, a roadmap of how we're going to get there, right? Because it's great to kind of come up with a plan that has sort of platitudes that are saying, you know, um, the plan, our goal is to achieve a quality housing, household for every resident in the city of Philadelphia. Well, yeah, that's great, but how much money does that cost and how are we going to get there? So this is really going to be more about the how are we going to get there. Um, so, so yes, that is, that is what we're about to get underway. Um, we don't have any say over sheriff sales, so let me just put that out there, but we understand that's an issue. Um, eviction Preservation Task Force, that's really being headed up out of um, the Office of Supportive Housing and, and that kind of group, we are participating on that. Um, and while evictions are an issue, I think right up front when that group was formed, one of the things they identified was that I think 80, 85% of evictions are because people can't afford to pay their rent. So I think that's something that we really want to take a closer look at as we're going through the housing plan. Um, because it's great to have, you know, maybe some just cause language or more education, but if the fundamental problem is people can't afford to pay their rent, we want to look at how do we address that problem. So we've asked, and, and thank you, planning department. Um, around that time, we also came up uh, and asked you to participate in a New West um, kind of strategy. Um, I share Market Street with the uh, great uh, Janie Blackwell uh, in the third district. And years later, we actually saw seeds planted and now that are bearing fruit. We've got a $50 million uh, deal on 59th and Market Street, which will be game changing uh, for that neighborhood. Speculators are already looking at the housing around it to try to, to purchase it because they know property values will increase. So thank you for giving us the um, intellectual property to be able to plan for today. So the second shoe to fall with that is how do we take those 300 properties that were identified by council president in my district um, to go into maybe, possibly, a lease purchase program so that you can avoid some of the upfront cost that a lot of young uh, stakeholders, and, and speak of the devil, I mean, I don't mean the devil, but Webster, <laughs> you heard this. See, Just for the record, see, Councilman yeah, Jones said that. I don't, I don't mean, he's a constituent, so he can't be the devil. But to come up with a strategy for affordable housing that could possibly include rent to own, lease purchase, build your credit up so that you can make settlement three three years from now, right. where, where is your thinking? So I think those are exactly the things that we are looking to explore. It's pretty clear that um, given what's been happening, particularly at the federal level with declining resources, that we really can't do th business as usual. That's not gonna get it done. So we have to get as creative as possible. And we realize that um, you know, we have some ideas, but we also need to find out from other people what their ideas are. So we would love to explore that kind of thing with you. Um, you know, for example, Councilwoman Sanchez came to us with an idea about doing something a little more creative in her district. Um, we went back and forth about it for a little while, but ultimately, you know, we got something out on, right? A little while. But ultimately, we got something out on the street, and, and we're trying it. And I think that's kind of what we want to do with folks is let's, 
let's figure out how we can make it workable, but then let's see if we can get it out. And, um, you know, we actually now we joke because we have a laundry list of pilots, um, but we want to try it and see if it works. And then if it work, if it's working, how do we expand that? And I think the biggest thing is for us to realize that, you know, back in the day when I was here 20 some years ago, government was the only game in town and we were doing it all on our own and we don't need to do that anymore, which requires a different way of thinking. So thank you for Matt Wisong, who is your planner that helps us out. And we look forward to working with you. And at the end of the day, you have a lot of these pilot programs, but you have to let us know which ones budget-wise you want to bring up to scale. And that's exactly what we're in the process of looking at. And, and let me just say really quickly, because when I first came here a couple years ago to do my testimony, you talked about your pipeline. I just want to acknowledge that we got one of yours done. Your pipeline has gotten one project short, shorter, <laughs> and that's a really, really we'll good we'll one. We'll take it. Yeah, we'll and that New time. West project is a really good one. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, Councilman Keanu Sanchez. <laughs> uh, good morning. We're still morning. Um, I'm going to quickly go through a couple of pieces and then just get to the point. I'm going to ask Angel to come in from the land bank because I just want to get some stuff on the record. So first want to thank planning. We've really been working on remapping our district between the transit-oriented development and we are looking at some creative overlays to give us some affordability and I appreciate all the work that's gone into it. I think what Councilman Greenley was talking about, I know you guys have the standard language of we oppose this because we just oppose to oppose. I think it sends a message to people watching TV that we're not talking and consulting with planning. So I think that's where you see the incongruency with us going to planning coming forth with something that is thoughtful and then you guys just opposing it because that's what you want to do on the record. You don't need to respond okay. to that. I think their language, again, your, your we'll team comes off. in here um, and they do their job, right? right. Um, and I also want to thank you on the preservation piece that, that we talked about. On the housing action plan, uh, and um, is the abatement discussion part of that or the abatement discussion that the mayor brought up the, the finance director brought a different than the housing plan. Uh, so it's my understanding that the abatement discussion is happening right now. Mm -hmm. So I think that discussion will inform what happens in the plan. But I actually think that that abatement discussion is probably a little bit ahead of our plan. Okay. So I'm sure that, that whatever happens there will definitely inform them. And I just want to make sure that as we talk about, you know, I think that, and, and I've said this to people over and over again, Philadelphia has, in part because of what council's done, um, have a value around home ownership. We still have a high number, regardless of our poverty, highest number of African American home ownership. Those are values, right? And so we we will do whatever we can to preserve that and and open um, other opportunities. And I think we're you know Councilman Kenyatta Johnson was here talking about this tale of two cities not having a very articulated broad plan. Um, forces us to create pilots, but not be more intentional about what we subsidize and what we don't subsidize. So going to that, um, I want to appreciate that we've moved a little bit around this land bank stuff. And I know that the conversation is a 30-year conversation. It's a 10-year one for, he, for me here in council, because we actually talked about this when I was in community development back in 1985. Um, so now that, that we're working, can you say, tell us what the timeline is over the next three months and six months about how we move the allocated money into the street and, and ramp up our acquisition? Okay. So I'm going to ask Angel to come yep. up. Oh, he's here. He has to say it he's here. I told him he had to <laughs> Came come up, up in my ready. blind spot. Came yeah. up in my blind spot. Angel Rodriguez, Executive Director of the Land Bank. Um, so moving forward, Sorry, I thought the, can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. All right. Um, uh, so moving forward, uh, in the past two weeks, uh, one of the first things that we had identified when we were working on acquisitions, and I believe the question centers around acquisitions, mm -hmm. were the legal status of the uh, identified and approved um, lots for acquisition, whether they had a tax information certificate or not. Um, 320 parcels had been identified by the board and approved. 
although 270 of those did not have a tax information certificate. Um, around December, we had requested that all the servicers then place tax, um, tax information certificates on all of those properties. The timeline given to us in getting those properties through mm -hmm. the uh, legal system to get it just to sheriff sale would be this coming November and October. That left us in a situation where we have allocated funds for acquisitions, so we decided to go on a camp, basically meet with every council of Matic district about backfilling those uh, numbers. Um, I did receive at the last board meeting approval and spending authority for up to 2.125 uh, of the balance of acquisition dollars that we have. Um, what I would like to say is that um, in every council district I've met, we've, my staff and I have met with most of the council members here and we've met with great you know, support. So we plan on in the next couple of uh, months, January, um, April, May, and June, to spend down that one, uh, one, two, five. Now that's an approximate number. There are parcels that we may lose to uh, you know, the, the, the resident paying off the tax lien. Uh, banks, bankruptcy issues and, and the like. But at this point, we plan to zero out that line item or get as close to it, and then also acquire the 270 in the new fiscal year. So one of the issues originally was the issue of the law department. Have we kind of streamlined that now around getting clearance? Um, I wouldn't, uh, I think for us it was a learning curve and understanding the, the tax uh, process. I mm -hmm. wouldn't say that it was a, a really a problem. What we were looking at to acquire, it was part of understanding where it was in, you know, in terms of being acquired. Okay. And, um, Cause you're going to use up my time. Hold up. And I have a, um, U.S. bank liens. Yes. Um, we have a lot of debate around whether they've been getting sold at sheriff sale independently. Yeah. So we've lost a lot of those. What is the position of the administration and can in fact we um, acquire those through the acquisition tool? So as everybody is aware, the acquisition policy that was passed last spring requires that a third party pay for the 97 bank liens and then the land bank can acquire. So somebody else has to pay the 97 lien. That does not mean that those parcels are not accruing tax, uh, you know, they're not tax delinquent up until now. Mm -hmm. So at this next board meeting, we are raising that issue, looking at with the land bank board to address this issue and raise it to really identify. So I want is. and to weigh in. If we're going to do a, uh, uh, an aggressive, comprehensive plan, how how, how are we going to make sure that five thousand parcels encumbered through the city are not left out of that? Uh, that's something we're going to have to address during the plan. I mean, we have to, that's a conversation where we have to have the finance department involved with that. Um, and I'll be honest with you, they understand how those liens work much better than I understand how those liens work, but I think that's something we have to talk through with them um, because I think that's an issue that's prevalent in more districts than we had anticipated and is definitely going to be something that we've got to think through with them because it is having a big impact. And so one of the things that I would say to you is a lot of those properties in districts like mine, I'm second to Councilwoman Bass, I have 1,358 of them, um, a lot of them are in what is gentrifying high value area. And at a certain point, um, we become a dollar stupid if we don't acquire them with our current lead position, because in addition to that lien, now there's a demolition lien on it, there's something else, there's a value to us picking that up. And that, we, we, if we wait too long, all right, that train's going to leave the station. And for me, everything below Lehigh that has value where we can intentionally uh, maintain and sustain some affordability becomes very important. So. Maybe you double tier this, you know, you say, okay, we can't look at the entire portfolio, but where we know markets are off the chain, where we have additional lean ca capacity because now we have a demo lean on it, in addition to, you know, the cash out that we did in 97, we should move on some of those. And I say that because in, in communities like Norris Square, um, I'm seeing them sell that share of sale and, and, and turned around and in some cases, people were taking care of them, and you know, we've lost them, right? Right. Yeah. And like I said, we understand that that's an issue in almost every district, and 
Um, you know, even in your district, I think we're starting to see that leak even north of Lehigh. So. Right. So can we at least get an agreement that in the next six months we have some sort of strategy for those high value areas? I'm sure Council President and uh, Councilwoman Bass and maybe even Councilwoman Blackwell, who shares most of these liens with me, there's some high value ones that we, we may not be able to wait for a, a big plan on U.S. banks, but on that immediate area, we need to make a decision. Right. So we can talk to the finance Department about that. Well, I, I'd like, and I'll ask, Council President is not here, I'd like the Council President to facilitate a, that kind of discussion sooner rather than later. If so he that facilitates again, a meeting, we will show up. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Sure. Um, and then, my time is up? Not yet. It's getting close. <laughs> oh, no. See, now I gave up my, 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 my time. Um, in terms, so you said that the, the, the abatement piece, the housing plan, what timeline did you say it was going to have and who's part of it? Is anybody um, from council as part of that housing discussion plan? Right, so because so, um, the council president's office has a, has a seat on the high housing advisory board, Herb Wetzel's been involved, but that is something that we plan to expand and to work with council over the summer about what's going on and, and how they want to have input into the plan and participate. And okay. the timing is we are, going to actually hold the consult potential consultant's feet to the fire this afternoon to say you are getting this plan done September, maybe beginning of October at the latest. Okay. All right. Yeah. Th thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councilwoman. Councilman Dom. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Still morning. <laughs> I have a couple of questions. I want to just follow up with Councilman Sanchez on a question I was just curious about, and that is uh, old liens and also the uh, demolition liens. I assume they all have interest and penalties attached to them. Do you know that answer? Uh, in terms of interest, uh, I, I don't believe there's interest, but I believe they accrue every year in terms of tax liens. So in a USA bank sale, it would be 97. That is held by a third party servicer. And then in 98, 99, and subsequently, there are new liens that are placed on that par parcel. The and if there are nuisance liens, right. like but the liens, that, liens. the liens that we place as a city, that they, people don't pay, whether it's banks or whatever, should have interest and penalties attached to them if they're not paid, I would assume. I'm unclear as to the detail of that. I would have to Maybe look you can into let us it. Know. I, I'm, I, I can't imagine we wouldn't have interest and penalties on those liens. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I'm saying that is in order to follow up with Councilman Sanchez's comment, if we start to see the market values in those areas starting to increase, at least if we have the interest and penalties piling up, our position is protected. So I think it's important to look at that and see what's going on. If, you, if we don't have it, you should let us know, and we should change that. Right, so we can check with finance and revenue. Yeah, I'm pretty sure you do have it. I just want to make sure. Um, let me ask you a question on the, uh, I heard different numbers. In the information we have, there's roughly, is it 5,735 city-owned properties right now? Uh, across the various entities, public property, redevelopment authority, land bank. Yeah. I think it's probably about right. Yes, okay, thanks. And I know that Councilman Squilla held an auction a couple years ago, two, three years ago, and I know that he, I think 157 properties were sold for 1.8 million. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the real estate taxes that are being generated by those, but I assume that of all those properties been transferred? Um, I'm not. 100% sure I know that there were still some settlements going through the board, but we can get more information on, on what right. exactly the status of those is and, and where they are real estate-wise. Because the analysis we should do there is not just the revenue we received of the 1.8, but it's the annual real estate taxes that we've taken now, converting them from non-paying parcels to people that are paying us taxes. Right, and we can maybe even take a step further and see if there's anything being developed on them. So could you do a little study on his sale? Because I, I think he did a great job in, in coordinating this sale as to the total dollars the city received and as we sit today, what we expect or anticipate in annual real estate taxes from those 157 properties that we put back into the hands of people who pay taxes. Then I have a question on your budget. I'm just not clear where I understand, so I'm just asking for clarification. In your uh, department summary under the Grants Revenue Fund, I, I know there's a reduction of about $56 million, and you have two major explanations of two different programs, and I'm not sure I really understand those programs, and I thought maybe you could explain those two programs. Okay. I'm going to ask Paul Cesario to come up.
morning. Paul Cesario, uh, Deputy Director for Finance. I assume you're referring to the $32 million decrease in the grants fund? Yeah, that's the big number in your budget. Right. Um, that's basically a $20 million uh, reduction in the appropriation request for the uh, interim construction assistance loan program and $10,500,000 for the Section 108 loan program. So explain, I don't know what those are exactly. They're not, it's not real money, it's an appropriation uh, authority so that if we were to get the loan, we would be able to establish it in Famous. Uh, we've been carrying it for a few years now and we don't anticipate uh, requesting or receiving those loans going forward. So we, re we reduced the appropriation request. Who would that, who would that loan come from? I was gonna say, so a section 108 loan oh. yeah. allows us to kind of advance our community development block grant from the federal government and, and then it goes out, and then and oftentimes that flows through to PIDC and they put that money out as loans and it recaptures and that's what pays it back. I think we reduced it by 10 and a half million because we don't anticipate us putting out section 108 loans to that amount. Um, so that's that portion of it. And then do you want to try to explain sure. the other 20 million piece? Yeah, um, about 10 years ago, um, when there were... Oh, we you have to say who you are. Oh, I'm sorry, Melissa Long, um, Director of Division of Housing and Community Development Programs. Um, when we had um, PHFA had a home ownership um, initiative um, and grant funds, and we also had a very, we had a high level of home program and CDBG funds, and we did, I would say, five to six very large scale home ownership um, redevelopment projects. Um, and as part of those redevelopment projects, um, we provided a loan and it was backed with community development block grant dollars. Um, now that PHF, the, the funding PHF. world is very different and PHFA no longer has um, those funds available and our home uh, funding has been reduced just in the last six years from about um, 16 million to eight, so we no longer anticipate doing that um, home ownership initiative. Right, so those are kind of long-term placeholders that we've had there for a while yeah. and we're just cleaning it up. And the PHFA Home Ownership Choice Initiative was something where they had a program where you partner a for-profit with a local nonprofit and they did 50 or more home ownership units, so Pradera Homes is that, there's some examples. Um, but frankly, when the mortgage market crashed um, right before 2008 for low-income families, they stopped doing that program. So we're, these are just kind of cleaning up the books issues. Yeah. If you could, uh, I'm not going to take any more time on this, but if you could break this down into like a fourth grade level for me, sure. I'd yeah. be very appreciative because it's well, a little confusing. The, yeah. the glossary of low-income housing yeah. terms. Yeah. 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 Only because it's such a big number, $32 million, and I'm looking at the budget saying, hey, why are we losing this money? Right, and, so, and, the, and the real answer is we never had it. Okay. <laughs> Let me ask another question. Under employee compensation, personal services is going up about 25%. Is that salary increases or are you adding? What no, are, what? So a lot of that is just transferring um, personnel from other departments. So we had a couple of our people that were being paid under PIDC that was creating an issue for us because they weren't city employees. So for example, they couldn't drive city cars and we couldn't buy them new city computers and they couldn't have access to some of the city databases and that was creating an issue. And then we also had several of our um, GIS staff were being paid out of, were in the um, Office of Information Technology, they've been transferred. So most of that is um, actually, it's not new employees, it's just employees getting transferred Existing employees that were paid out of other departments' budgets now being paid out of our budget. <clears throat> you know it would be helpful then, because I keep hearing this that from a few people that have come before us so far, that our budgets are higher <coughs> because they've transferred people from other departments. But when the other departments come up, their budgets aren't lower. <laughs> So I'm just trying to I figure can't speak out, like, for anybody else's budget, but we can give you a list and a breakdown. Well, we I, do I would like to know specifically. Yeah and ask those departments when they get a transfer out to see a, <coughs> a footnote as to where the savings is of the money coming out of their department. Right. Um, and the other thing to notice is we did in um, fiscal year 18, this one, <coughs> we did get some additional dollars to hire uh, some additional people in development services. 
Um, so that's okay. probably reflected is in it, our Is that why your center. employees are going up from uh, 12 people because of the transfers? Um, yes, other than we did, so we did in fiscal year 18, we um, got dollars to hire two additional people for the historic commission and to hire two additional people for development services. What do we get three? Development services. Three. Three for development services. We had lost one, and then we picked that one up, and then we got two more. On the housing trust fund, the way it works right now, I want to make sure I understand it. If someone needs a repair to their home, and I'm totally in favor of that, by the way, it could be ten or twenty thousand dollars in that range, typically. And is that a grant or is that a loan against their property? So currently, right now, our home repair programs, basic system repair, adaptive modification, which um, so adaptive mod can also be for renters, as can weatherization. Those are grant dollars, and it, there is not a lien placed on the property. And the work, um, well. For basic system repairs, the work can go up to 17.5. Traditionally, it ends up around, uh, the average is around 10. But currently, it's grant dollars, no lien. Do you think it should be, a, I'll use an example of a property worth 50000 and we give a city grant of 17.5, and the property then sells in five years for 150000 do you think that should be a lien or a grant? So that is something that we're actually looking at right now. We're doing a, um, in coordination with um, some researchers from Penn, right. looking at what happens to the property when we put the money in, kind of what happens, how many of them get sold, how many of them do we have to repair again, just doing all that data analysis to look at those kinds of things. I mean, I, I would be in favor long term to having them as liens, so when the money comes back to the city, we can repair more houses. Right, yeah, and one of the things we're looking at is to, is that and to ensure that it would be kind of a, a third party sale for, so for example, if you were leaving it to your child or your spouse, it wouldn't necessarily become due them, but if you sold it to a unrelated party, right. that, that money could come well, th back. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you. you, thank you, Councilman. Councilwoman Blackwell. Thank you very much. We certainly uh, want to, to commend the department on returning citizens being hired. We hope that, um, we know there are plans for more. We hope that we can um, increase that as much every, every month we hear more and more about these returning citizens. And all of us uh, are involved with uh, many meetings with uh, regard to them. I deal with a group called One Click a lot. And uh, I want to ask you, you mentioned uh, Philadelphia 2035, where we are and where you see that in the future. Um, so, you want to talk? <laughs> and here comes Eleanor. Good afternoon, Councilwoman. We're actually wrapping up the West District Plan. We'll be presenting that, the final version uh, for recommendation to the Planning Commission next week for them to adopt it. And we have one more plan that we're doing, the Upper Northwest, which we hope to conclude shortly thereafter. So we'll be finished with all the 18 districts this year. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. Councilman Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just have some quick questions in reference to the um, budget testimony. On page nine of your budget testimony, you talk about other budgetary impacts and made reference to uh, community development block grant, home dollars, HOPWA, uh, and other um, funding initiatives coming from HUD. A few weeks ago, um, Congress and the uh, President passed into law the new omnibus appropriations bill, which increased about $300 million for CDBG dollars and funding. Um, what steps uh, is the city taking to get some information regarding those additional dollars and how that will be allocated possibly to Philadelphia? Um, so although the omnibus overall within the country raised the amount, we have not received our allocation. Um, allocation has based on a formula. Mm -hmm. Um, so we have yet to see what that is gonna mean for us. Last year we got our allocation uh, June. End of June. End of June. So it was end of June before we found out from our, I think we were around 38 million 38 last year. 38 million in community development block. Yeah. Yes. Um, so we will see. Uh, there, I, I, 
I hate to say this, but there actually have been years in the past when the federal dollars have gone up and our allocation has actually gone down based on the formula. Um, so we are um, cautiously optimistic that we may see a little bump. Last year we went down about $200,000. Um, we are right now budgeting for flat and hope to be pleasantly surprised. If you were to receive additional dollars, um, how would you, and on, I know it depends on the amount of funds you receive, but what areas would you prioritize um, if you did receive additional funding? Uh, again, I think we want to see what, what the dollar amount is. Um, t typically, we have a high emphasis placed on homeless prevention and preservation. Um, I would assume that our kind of priorities would, would remain the same. But again, it would be helpful to understand exactly what type of funding program and what those increases were. If it's block grant, if it's home, um, that kind of thing. We are taking a hit in our um, HOPWA dollars. Uh, so some of the rental assistance we've been able to provide for that type of housing is going away. So I think we'd want to look overall at, at um, you know, do we bolster existing? Um, do we try to cover, make up for past losses? But I think, you know, overall we tend to um, emphasize, like I said, homeless prevention and, and preservation. Uh, next question is more of a planning um, question. I know one of the issues that's come up in var various meetings of the Pennsylvania Municipal League was, um, has been regarding preemption in reference to the new initiative regarding 5G. Uh, have you followed any of the litigation, I mean, any of the legislation at the state level or any of the initiatives in other states where they are trying to preempt um, local jurisdictions from their zoning laws and codes in reference to implementing uh, kiosks or other type of um, uh, technology from a 5G perspective? I think you've caught me flat footed. I, I don't know. I don't know anything about that, but Philadelphia, we are um, a home rule state, so I'm not sure if what the state comes up with, because they follow the Pennsylvania Municipal Code. We don't, as a city, follow that. We have our own rules and regulations, but I will check into that and see where we stand and how we stack up against that. Yeah, the reason I raised that, some of the technology companies have been going from state by state yeah. and getting um, various legislative bodies to uh, implement um, legislation that would preempt any local Okay. zoning laws to allow them to move out in reference to uh, implementation of 5G from a technology perspective. I know I, I connected uh, Matt Stitt with Amy Sturgis from the Pennsylvania Municipal League because I know the council president's office has been following that issue, but I was curious from an administration perspective if there's been any um, thought on that issue. We will think about it now. Yeah, okay. so, and if you've got any specific information that you'd like us to take a look at, that would be great. We can work with you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. <clears throat> thank you, Councilman. Councilwoman Gibb. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, good afternoon. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I just want to thank my colleagues who've been asking a number of different questions about the Housing Action Plan. Um, one of the things that I wanted to ask a little bit about um, as you were talking uh, about the eviction task force, the anti-eviction task force that we've been serving on together. Um, some research has come out of TRF that just shows the tremendous disparity between market rate rentals in some of our most low-income neighborhoods compared to actual income in those neighborhoods as well. Um, whether there's any discussion potentially within the housing, housing action plan about the creation of a potential local, local voucher program. Um, to provide uh, rental subsidies. This is something that DC and you know Denver just recently announced as being fairly expansive. I'm curious if you, you know, what your thoughts are on that and what the possibility of, of further discussion about that is. Right, well, um, as we mentioned at the beginning of our testimony, what we realize is, um, you know, even at the beginning of the work of the Eviction Preservation Task Force, they identified that you know, 80, 85% of people get evicted because they can't pay their rent. <laughs> um, it's as simple as that. So I think through the work of the Housing Action Plan, we want to we want to kind of tackle that. Um, to be honest, I'm not sure exactly what the solution is going to be. So it may be some kind of a shallow rent program. It may be some kind of assistance to um, small landlords to help them be able to improve the quality of their units. It may be a menu of things. But I think something like a voucher program is, is on the table as well. I think all these different things are on the table. And we need to figure out, um, honestly, there's probably not a magic bullet. 
um, but we got to figure out kind of what are the menu of options and, and what we can afford because I think the other thing about this plan is while we want to have aspirational goals, we also want to be able to be realistic about what we can achieve and what it's going to take us to achieve those things. Mm -hmm. So the quarter million dollars that's in the budget right now, is that for a continuation of something that already exists? Is it for something that's um, newer? For the housing action plan? For, uh, it looks like it was for the... Uh, your testimony mentioned an additional quarter million related to the housing action plan. Right. Is that so, to so we were able to. Things? So there was a um, a project that had been on the books for a long time that got refinanced, and part of that was they paid us the 250, and again it went to a different department, and they transferred it in to cover the cost of our housing. So that's the mm -hmm. cost to get the plan done for the consultant to get it printed for this a community engagement, all that piece. So that's what that quarter of a million dollars is for. Okay, so not necessarily towards a voucher subsidy no, program or anything no, like no. that. No, no, this is just the plan, it's and then we'd have to look at our other resources that we have, home, block grant, housing mm -hmm. trust fund, to figure out um, what, would there be a mechanism to float um, uh, that kind of thing. I mean, and frankly, we're also looking at uh, is there a way for us to seed something that then gets other folks to invest right. in. I mean, we're, all that kind of thing is on the table about how we can best use our dollars. Okay. I think that's helpful, and we'd love to just stay in touch with you through this. I think yes. one of the outcomes of the, uh, you know, the anti-eviction task force is the challenge that we've got if the subsidies don't go directly, more directly towards uh, the individuals who are in need, um, you know, and and the cost, well, and I think, you know, the, as we've seen, the right, cost. Right, the advocacy that eviction. we're probably going to have to do because it's when you're tremendous. at those very, very low income levels, yeah. probably the only answer is something like a Section 8 voucher. Right. And I think we're going to have to do some more advocacy at the federal level around that yeah. as well. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Um, and then one of, you know, one of the programs that a number of us on council really pushed for was the money going into the legal aid for, uh, for, um, for tenants who are facing eviction. And um, I know that DPD uh, kicked in an additional $100,000 into um, to make it uh, from your CDBG grant funding so that we could get to a half a million dollars and really launch a significant RFP process. And I think we're really happy with the direction that it's going, being based in landlord-tenant court, having already triggered some nice reforms that we're seeing happen in, uh, in the courts as well. has been really uh, a positive experience. So, um, you know, there has been some changes around the funding. We're obviously going to have to negotiate around all of that. But is it your understanding that the $100,000 from DPD will continue towards the anti-eviction work? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that's, so that comes out of our um, consolidated plan budget. And I think we continue, we, we want to continue to, to fund that. And I know that we've been talking with, um, with that group about how we can support the plan in general. And then contingent okay. upon what our allocation is. Right, and um, contingent, yeah. yes, mm -hmm. and always contingent always on whatever our federal allocation is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we, like I said, we anticipate, mm -hmm. we're hopeful that we have at minimum level funding. If that is the case, we will have some dollars. Yeah. I mean, obviously, we consider that to be a really ambitious effort. We just kicked off a really great mm -hmm. process, and it just is difficult if we're if that whole thing is uncertain. A lot of people have invested a tremendous yes. amount of time so, yeah. we, to make that work. We, yes, we yeah. we understand that across the board. We really, honestly, we have some very excellent programs in Philadelphia. Some, you know, people always say, "Are we looking at best practices?" And oftentimes, we do. And what we find out is we are actually. Um, involved in the best practices, but resourcing those best practices mm -hmm. is, is generally more of the issue than we don't have the best practice. Yeah. <laughs> well, last year you made a really impassioned plea around the Fair Housing Act and the importance of it and what it meant, and obviously with tomorrow being that 50th anniversary of mm -hmm. uh, the Fair Housing Act, and given yes. the situation that we're in federally, it's not the best of times, but the city is still... Um, committed to very um, much so right very to much AFFH so. and um, yep. can you talk a little bit about some of the first year accomplishments that you remain committed to yeah so I mean I think one of the biggest ones is we just work with um, the Philadelphia Housing Authority in um, I can't remember exactly what it's called but it, traditionally housing authorities have had a fair market rent that that um, applies across the board in a city Small so area. Spot area FMR. So spot area fair market value. So I think they've broken the city down into three three different areas. So there will now be kind of a fluctuating rent that is supported. 
by them um, based on the income level of the location or the what what is seen as the fair market rent in that location. So it used to be if you were in um, you know some of the most distressed census tracts in the city, that unit would get the same amount of rent support as a, a rental unit in Center City. So there was a disparaging you know it was sort of mm -hmm. so we were really kind of pushing people to, to different zip codes, let's yeah. put it that way. So we've worked with the housing authority and, and that is I think gonna allow more access to housing throughout the city as opposed to just certain census tracts. So that's one of the things we're looking at. Well, and again, I think the um, um, eviction um, that came out of the assessment of fair housing. And then also uh, we were able to do a preservation of uh, subsidized rental um, housing, and that was another goal that was that came out of that AFFH process. Okay. Yep. Okay. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we look forward to joining you. Uh, these guys do oh, yeah. in Chicago. Oh, that's right. See you. I'm yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. Today. And the yeah. anti displacement well, network. I know. I think it'll be really an important time for us to get out of our local. That's right. Kind yeah. of yes. mentality and try to think <laughs> a little bigger. So that's great. Right. I look forward to it. Great. Thank you, Councilwoman. Um, i got a couple of quick questions and then turn over to Councilwoman Keona Sanchez. Um, planning here? I mean, art, our art folks oh, here? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Do you want to come forward? I'm happy to go. Eleanor, you should stay. And real quick, um, in your budget detail, you show a $450,000 reduction in funding for the PHS. What in the world is that about? This is one of our uh, so better community-friendly neighborhood beautification. Right. <laughs> da, da, da. Why are we cutting their budget? I don't right. So, um, as I'm, you're probably aware that's our that's our land care program. Uh, I think uh, you know there's just a lot of funding priorities in the city, and funding that one priorities for whom took a hit. For whom? I think just I mean, for the administration a, I mean, I, as a I whole, know, there's just different funding priorities. No, there's when you schools, say funding, there's opioids, hold, 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 that hold, hold, kind hold of stuff. Hold on a second, please. When you say funding priorities, you mean funding priorities for whom? For the city. I mean, for so the administration. For the administration? For the administration. Okay, all right. So that's not a priority to maintain and create employment opportunities and educational opportunities for. I think those things do. are priorities, but I think there's different, there's different programs that are being funded to achieve those, and I think there was a there are different programs Decisions to made beautify. to fund different programs. You sure you want, all right. So you're telling me that there are different programs that maintain vacant lots. The, matter of fact, we just had a meeting with this, the administration and PHS about expanding the role. So maybe somebody's not talking to somebody else. I don't, there was a conversation about shifting because the PHS treatment is long-term. The clip is basically going in, cleaning a lot up, and moving on. And more often than not, those lots tend to end up needing additional treatment in about three weeks because there's no long-term maintenance strategy. So I don't understand that priority for a whole lot of reasons. I mean, there's a graduation for a number of individuals, and I know the administration's priorities as it relates to um, individuals, uh, returning citizens is on paper right. and in the press yeah. significant. There's an awesome program. Mayor and I attended a graduation last year. I believe there's one coming up or, or may have just happened. So I don't, when you talk about priorities, I don't understand that. We have a program called Zero Waste. And basically when PHS does a lot, it ends up being zero waste or for whatever reason, they put those little wooden fences around there and, People right. come in and maintain it. It's like zero waste versus other. So yeah. when you talk I mean, about priorities, why, why are all these things priorities, but yet it's not priority in, the, in terms of the budget? PHS is a great program. This is a great program. They do a great job. Um, <laughs> um, I, don't, I, I can't disagree with anything that you've said. Okay. So that's not within your jurisdiction. Is that what you're saying? I mean, I got to ask the question. I'm not. I understand. I mean, like I said, we support the program. We think they do a great job. We've expanded it. It, it employs returning citizens. It does all the things that, that you said. Um, yeah. I just... 
Okay. We're in a situation this, where, this, unfortunately, this, not everything is, is this a gets recommendation funded. of your division, or is this a budget recommendation from Mr. Debeau Finance? I think our preference is that we would have full funding for this program. Okay, there you go. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. Good afternoon. So. You've been selected today to ask, to <laughs> respond to the annual question about uh, our ability to get revenue outside of traditional sources, and I'm going to keep talking about sticking our hands in the taxpayers' pockets because that's, you know, that's what governments do everywhere. But then, every now and then there's an opportunity to get revenue outside of that, and I'm assuming you're familiar with this whole issue around municipal advertisement. Um, yes. I don't know how long you've been there. A few years ago we put out an RFP. It was actually under the Nutter administration and it went through the process, public property, scrutiny, the whole nine yards. It was an issue about uh, certain buildings that had bond debt on it that were not, which was probably thinking. I still don't understand that whole notion, how that would not qualify your ability to advertise on a building. But anyway, it was what it was. Put out RFP, company went through the process, got selected, was prepared to move ahead, designs, everything. Then the art commission decides that, well, you know what? We don't want the sign up there. And then after questioning, they said, well, you know, we would like to see another, another design or another strategy or come back. But the company, and I don't care about any particular company, but that particular company who went through that process continues to be told that you need to come back with something different. And they're at a loss as to what it is that they would like to see because they, I believe they were going to pay us around seven hundred dollars to $800,000 annually just for three signs. So can you tell me what's the position of the Art Commission this year? I assume that you're talking about the signs that were proposed for MSB in one parkway? Correct. Can you say your name? Yes. William Burke, Director of the Art Commission. Um, as I believe that the Commission looked at that proposal in the same way that it looks at any proposals in terms of its concern for the character of the public areas that it has jurisdiction over. And the members of the commission felt that signs that large on the sides of our civic buildings were not an appropriate thing. And they, I think they, they had certainly understood the goal of the proposal for the city in terms of bringing in revenue and suggested that there might be other ways to have advertising. I would, I, I'm paraphrasing them, perhaps on a smaller scale, physical scale, uh, on, on the civic spaces that they could get behind. So you're talking about the size of the signage which was not digital, by the way. I just want to make right. sure. You didn't yeah. say it, but I just want to make sure people... Yeah. It's not, I understood it's not that. 11 in market. Right. It's static signs. Um, I, can't, I, I can't speak for my commission. You, you, members, can, look out the, you can look out the window. You can see, you know, um, signs probably were no bigger than that Eagle sign that we put on City Hall. But that's another story, right? We didn't get... All right? Right. All right. That's okay. The Eagles won, and we were... You know, happy that they won. Um, so I'm just trying to get clarity. The issue is the size. The, the size was certainly an issue. I think pos the fact that they were actually on these buildings may have been a question too. Uh, that there may have been other ways of doing it, sort of on the ground, that would on have been equally accessible to viewers. On the ground. Yeah, that would have been, e not, not literally on the ground surface, but uh, perhaps some kinds of kiosks and other things that would be visually accessible to a great number of people, but would not be the whole so, side of a building. So similar to the urban experiential proposal that was put before the city, and we figured out a way not to accept that, that was done by about three or four years ago. Was that, would that be acceptable? There were that, like three of them. Remember, Councilman DeChico, well, yes. former Councilman DeChico came in with a group. They wanted to do an urban experiential. Right, and most of those uh, were going to be on private property, as I remember. No, it was going to be one right out there on the MSB Plaza. 
Right, and that, that was that was I think that was before the signs on the buildings. Right, I'm only and bringing so there was it up kind of an order of discussion. There, if there. it's not on the building, then it was <laughs> on the ground. So there was a proposal to put it on the ground, and that was actually going to generate even more revenue than the static signs. So, what was the issue with that? No, they 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 never came in with an official proposal, uh, so they weren't they weren't refused. Um, I cannot say at this point in time, having seen several different kinds of proposals, what the commission's position would be on any one of them relative to the other ones now. Okay, so if the entity that won the RFP, mind you that everybody signed off, and the people that actually make policy, and I guess clearly the art commission dictates policy because at the end of the day they said, well, I don't care what you all said because they responded to the RFP that we put out. So it wasn't like they came and said, this is what we want to put on the building and then without any process, without any review, they did everything we asked them to do. And then the Art Commission says no. Uh, I believe the Art Commission actually even got a letter from the mayor saying that they supported the proposal. Am I correct? I don't recall that letter. I'll, give you, I'll get it you. It may have gone directly to the chairman or something, but I... I saw the letter, so I don't know. Maybe it got sidetracked on the way over to the Art Commission meeting, but I got a copy of the letter from the administration. All right, so you're asking the individuals, because I want to be sure I know what to tell them, because they ask me all the time, what are we supposed to do? Because there was no clarity. They said, come back with something else. So you're saying either smaller signs or something that's on, I guess, the grounds of it that would be equally as visible? And I don't know how that happens, but. I, I, my personal answer would be that would be a step in the right direction. But again, I can't speak for what the commission would say to anything that comes before them. So you're not really the person to answer my question. Yeah, the, the, I mean, the commission, the appointed commission is the decision-making body. I am their I'm staff gonna say, person. I asked for the yeah. art commission. <laughs> you, you show up, so. If you're not the person that can respond, I'm fine. I mean, I just need to know that, because I don't want to keep belaboring the point if you're not the person that can respond to a policy decision. So the, the pr Bill is the staff person for the art commission who works with the commission, appointed commissioners. So as a body, they're the one who would give an opinion. So I'm not sure so, what their final opinion was on. So we'll get a we commission can, member. It would be best to get a commission member. Well, I don't think, an, 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 I think that's the issue. An individual commission member couldn't speak for the entire body as well. Why it not? would be, have to be a. You want the whole, I mean, if you want to bring the, the whole, whole body over here, that's fine. So I, I think probably what needs to happen <laughs> is we could probably um, facilitate a meeting with the successful respondent of the RFP. Maybe we can get Bill and the um, chair of the Art Commission together and maybe have a conversation about what it would take to move this forward. Okay, but I'd like to have a public discussion. Ava, after. my issue, this is my issue. Yeah. I'm, you know, I don't I, care about signs. You know, I, right. I go to New York, I get wild like everybody else. I look at 11 Mark, I say, yeah. oh, okay, we're moving ahead, well, right? But it's about the money, right? And we're asking people to stick their hands in their pockets, give up money. If there's ability, like SEPTA did, get a lot of money for advertisement, then we need to take advantage of that. And while we're, we can't figure out a way to do that is beyond me, right. simply because somebody from the commission says you can't do that. And I'm right. just... Everybody else is getting money, but we can't get money. Yeah, well, and I know that you had, um, that Alan Greenberger, who's the chair of the Art Commission, came last year for budget testimony, yeah. and yeah. you guys had a conversation yeah. on the record. Um, it sounds like since that time, the ball has not moved forward. Um, so if uh, facilitating a meeting that could be about how do we move the ball forward would be helpful, we'd be happy right. to facilitate that. Just try, just try and get the money. I All think right. certainly the last uh, thing that I recall in the public meeting was that an offer was made to the applicants to sit down and talk about how it might move forward. And as far as I know, that we've never heard from them. Yeah, but they didn't tell them what to come back with. I mean, somebody goes through a, a year of process and spending money, right? And I'm sure they had the money to spend. 
And then they get to the final hurdle, and the art commission says, no, we're not willing to entertain placing it on the building. So if you guys want them to come back, I would think you would give them some direction in terms of what well, that, they should come back with. That was the offer, to have a discussion, a meeting outside of the, of the regular commission meeting to discuss what the direction might be. And you believe that that offer was made and they didn't respond? That, yeah, as far as I know. All right, I'm going to check. Okay, thank, thank you for being here. All right, thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, yes, sir. I'm sorry. Councilwoman McKeon Sanchez. Thank you. Uh, I'll be quick. My two points are, are pretty quick. I, I just wanted to follow up, and now the council president uh, puts it in that light. I want to make sure that when we're looking at, and I know that Councilman Dom doesn't mean it this way around leaning stuff, but we don't lean when we give incentives to big developers. I want to caution us in leaning poor people and taking away their asset value and their ability, given the redlining and, and lending that happens. Um, I know we lean the lots and we do a bunch of stuff, but when we're looking at housing preservation and other things, let's be careful and more balanced in our approach. And I hope it's something you should pencil in as part of your housing plan, because I would personally oppose stuff like that. I just think that we don't ask developers to lean their value that we're giving them when we incentivize them. I think part of it is the paradigm shift about what's an investment and what's an expense, right? And those of us who look at housing preservation, basic systems as incentives, we need to do a better job of reminding everybody that that's an incentive and not an expense. So we got our work cut out for us. Just, I hate hearing about you know, all the rich people who are paying all the taxes. But anyway, I digress. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, real quickly, as, as we look, and I, we, I talked about it a little bit um, yesterday with, with the land bank director, but as we talk about this housing plan, um, and I'm debating whether I'm going to go to the land bank board and have this conversation, we really need to look at value of acquisition and disposition policies as it relates to struggling neighborhoods, right? Right now, we have a dollar value attached to what we want to acquire around debt. And you and I, two years ago, walked the Gurney Street area where I showed you 600 lots that would never fall in any of our acquisition or disposition policies. And so I want to specifically ask the housing plan to look at that, right, in areas like that. The fact of the matter is that um, we're spending $12 million in overtime over there for police overtime and it'll cost us $1,500 to acquire a lot that we can turn over and make a tax paying, right? So I think the return on investment is there, even on the short term, when we talk about public safety. Um, but if, if, if as part of the housing plan, we can look at neighborhoods like that, who are around Conrail tracks and other things where the value is not quite there, we're spending a lot of, in, with the zero waste stuff, um, we're spending a lot of time telling people that their area is dirty <laughs> and no plan about how we clean it. So I think this is when your department can have a broader view around, uh, uh, around trash and, and public safety and looking at some of those components so that they look at those budgets that we're spending in those areas and again, change the methodology and the paradigm of these are investments you know, it's like when we have our prison and criminal reform agenda that we're saying we're going to get people out of prison. This, I think this is a component of it, right? And if we're going to convince <coughs> the citizens of Philadelphia that we are being good stewards of their money before we ask them for additional money, I think those are the things they're going to ask us to look at, right? Mm -hmm. What is going on to long-term residents who've lived in trapped communities for a long time where we're okay with spending police money, but we're not okay with. Yeah, so. I, I understand. So um, just a couple of quick things. One is I know that the, the land bank is, is getting ready to put that RFP in on the street for their strategic plan, um, which typically incorporates acquisition and disposition policies. And I think those frankly will always be a work in progress right? Right. as we adjust to what's going on in our city and what's going on in specific neighborhoods. Um, and then in addition, I think, it, well, it's great that the land bank has that. I think 
based on the processes we've been through over the last few years, it's, it's kind of clear that we could do a better job having an overall strategy within the city around vacancy, regardless of who owns it. Um, so that is something that we are, are looking at and trying to find out if we can get resources to actually dedicate um, somebody that that's what they would do. They would just look at doing full time, looking at a vacancy strategy for the city and not sort of trying to do it in their spare time but really start to look at some of those issues and be able to do a, a deeper dive than I think what we've been able to do in the past. Okay, and then lastly, one of the things that came up when we were talking around the finance side, and again, I think this is where planning has to come. You know, um, we, we're carrying a lot of capital money going back to 2004 in our, in our five-year plan, um, and we need to clean that up. Yeah. Like, we, we need, I'm still not clear, and I'll still, I'm going to continue the public discussion with Anna and everybody else, why we're carrying things for 10 years, 15 years on borrowed money, and I know they say they work on a cash basis, then let's clear it from our books. You have a five, <laughs> I mean, I, if you guys like killing trees just to print this stuff is one thing, right? But we need, we need to, good financial practices and to show folks that we're able to get projects done. And then leads me to the second discussion. Um, uh, uh, Mike Carroll talked a little about that there's no written standards around what's soft cost around capital things. We need to get there, right? Right, right. I, th I think there's a lot of over-engineering, a lot yeah. of... Well, you know that we've spent. been working more closely with public property around that. I think, um, you know, we will continue And I think, what, I think water has done a, I mean, uh, public property has done a better job. I'm looking at infrastructure stuff, because here again, and then I'll leave, uh, leave you with this. I think there's some missing opportunities, and I came up with this, I forgot what I called it, a community development zone or something when I first got elected and thought I could <laughs> change the world. But anyway, one of the things that that particular time we looked at was, what is the water department doing? What's the streets department doing? What's PennDOT doing? And how do we come up with a strategy so that we're all investing and the projects happen at the same time, right? Because then that's more transformative. Now that you have this portfolio, we need to get better at that, right? Yeah. So that the issue of what street gets done or you know what uh, pavements get done get more aligned with the other stuff that we're doing. And we haven't had the conversation. Um, you know, I know Rebuild came up with some matrix about what they were looking at, but we should be able to do that in a, a more coordinated way. Right. And we we actually are working on that. And again, one of the meetings I have this week is we've been collecting data from a diff bunch of different departments and putting that into sort of a web-based mapping tool. Um, we're trying to talk about how we utilize that within different departments, but I think that's also we want to, um, we're trying to get to the point where we can come in and talk to you about how to use that information to plan about um, and what's happening in your districts, because I think as Eleanor mentioned, we're at the point of being done with the district plan soon, and then it really becomes all about implementation then. Right. And that's and something we'll be reaching out about. Yeah, and the issue of, of that kind of planning and thoughtfulness, right? One of the issues, and I brought this up before, and I'll, you know, I'll, uh, and I brought it up to Michael Carroll. When the city is pursuing federal and state grants that restrict the utilization of money, and then come to us as a district level to match that so we can get a project done, and it comes with all of these restrictions, we need to have a conversation about it. I mean, it took me 18 months to be able to do bike lanes on American Street in an industrial zone. That was not a fun process, right? And then we become the bad guys because we don't want bike lanes, but you want to put raised bike lanes where I have 63 foot trucks turning, right? And then I need to be con considerate of the radius plus the bus stop plus everything else and then I'm the problem. And so even how we pursue funding around that kind of community design, if we do it on the front end, because I don't ever want to be told again that you know we're going to lose the money because I'm trying to accommodate a 63 foot truck and preserve 40 manufacturing jobs and a raised bike lane. Like, right. I shouldn't have to be doing that. Yeah. So I think just being more thoughtful in our planning as we do that will be very helpful, right? Because mm -hmm. then the conversation is not me being against it because I have to accommodate every business I have on America Street, which by the way, three of them are leaving, right? Because right. even after this process and even as thoughtful as we were, more steel is selling, I'm out, and now I have everybody wanting to come in and do housing over there and then my few manufacturers that I love are like, okay, Maria, I may be next. And it all because we created a, a restriction for ourselves right. in the right. conversation. Because yeah. the conversation with them wasn't, can we? It was, we're going to, 
And then what do you need so that we can do, you know, that top-down decision? Um, I'm going to lose jobs there. And then it works against what our bigger purpose around keeping those jobs there. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Chair. <laughs> Thank you, Councilwoman. No other questions? Uh, Thank you all very much. Sure. Thank you for your time. Um, Thank you. Uh, committee will uh, take a break here, stay in recess until one, one, huh? one o'clock. It'll probably be a little later than that. <laughs> Thank you. Huh? <laughs>